a loud shout, stand up and shout, hallelujah! Hallelujah! Why don't we go to God in Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for our Bible study tonight and praise your name. We well, thank you because anytime we come together like this, we know Christ, the Savior, the Redeemer, is in our midst. He is our Savior. He is our healer. He is our sanctifier. He is our baptizer in the Holy Ghost, in the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, I pray tonight, you reveal yourself to everyone in Jesus' name. And I pray that we'll see Christ in the study. We'll see Christ in the Bible. We'll see Christ in our prayer. We'll see Christ ministry to everyone in Jesus' name. Keep us alive. Wake up those who are sleeping and those who are tired and retiring. Let strength come to them in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the active, courageous people of our lives say, Amen. We're coming to John chapter 12. We'll be looking at the gospel according to St. John. And I went chapter 12, and I come to verse 20. Tonight, we're looking at chapter 12, verses 20 to 36. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was a Bethsaida of Galilee. And desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Sir, everybody, we would see Jesus. Say it for yourself, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew, and Philip tell Jesus. Verse 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Here was the response of Christ to the people that said they wanted to see him. You see these people, they had come to Jerusalem. They had not seen Christ. They had partaken of the Passover feast. They had not seen Jesus. It says, the Bible says they had worshipped even in Jerusalem, and yet they had not seen Jesus. The priests have ministered to them, and the priests have led them through circumcision. Because, you see, although these people were Greeks, they had to be circumcised, to be allowed to come to Jerusalem, and to be allowed to partake in the Passover. Nobody can partake of that Passover without being circumcised. These people had been circumcised, and yet they had not seen Jesus, and they felt empty. They felt that they didn't have the what it takes to get to heaven. All that they had done, all they had said, all they had gone through had not allowed them to see the way to glory. Because Jesus Christ is the way, is the truth and the life. And because of that, while going back home, they said, how can we go like this? We're still empty, and we do not have everything we ought to have, even what the Passover land symbolized, we don't have. We have not seen him. That's why they came and they said in that chapter 12, reading again from that verse, uh, verse 20, it says, There were certain Greeks among them which came up to worship at the feast, that is, at the Passover feast, and the same came therefore to Philip which was of Bethsaida of Galilee. And they desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. They came to Philip, because they saw something in Philip. As people look at you, they can tell whether you have the right connection or not. As people look at you, they can tell whether you have met Jesus yourself, or you know Jesus yourself, or you have the ability and the capacity to lead them to Jesus. And so as they looked around, they saw a priest, they said, ah, that one cannot. And they saw religious people, they said, no, those ones cannot. And when they saw Philip, they said, said, 
This person looks like he knows Jesus. This person looks like he has been with Jesus. And they said, sir, they respected him. They honored him because of the position that he had. They said, we would see Jesus. We cannot live until we see Jesus. You see, as we have come to the Bible study tonight, that should be the passion of your soul. That should be the desire of your heart. That you don't just want to come to the Bible study and just attend it like a feast and just attend like a regular person who has always been coming. I was there. I was there. I was there. And you saw nothing. And you got nothing. You are getting something today. And you must be able to make the connection, understanding that except to see Jesus, all the worship is in vain, all the study is in vain, all the denominational attachment, deeper life or lower life or shallow life, everything is in vain. Except to see Jesus, the real purpose of deeper life in your life will not be fulfilled. Except to see Jesus, the purpose of worship and study will not be fulfilled. And so, Philip told Andrew. You see, Andrew is known for bringing people unto Christ. What do people know you for? Do they know you for evangelizing? Do they know you for connecting people with Christ? Do they know you for reading the Bible? Do they know you for a spiritual life, a dynamic life, a life that attracts other people to Jesus? You see, Philip recognized that if I'm going to take these people to Jesus, I need to talk to Andrew because Andrew is a one that we know. He brought Peter to Christ. He brought others to Christ. He brought that lad to Christ. And these people are coming now. I must tell Andrew, are you like that? That somebody wants to do good. And he says, I can have a helping hand in him. I can have a helping hand in him. Because if I tell him, if I tell Andrew, if I tell her, if I tell that person that is known for bringing people to Christ, he will help me. Are you the people that will hinder other people from seeing Christ? You are there, and anybody that wants to see Christ, you stand in the way instead of helping. You are hindering. But you know, Andrew was a helper. I will be a helper. I'll be a doorway to Jesus. When other people want to see Jesus, they'll be able to see something in me that they'll go through me. They'll go through you in Jesus' name. Are you connecting others to Christ? Are you connecting inquirers to Christ? Are you connecting sinners to Christ? Are you connecting seekers? Those who are seeking peace, they're seeking salvation, they're seeking righteousness, they're seeking life. Are you connecting seekers unto Christ? There are people who come to worship and they, they've gone to that other place, they've gone to that other place. Are you connecting them to Christ? Is your life connecting them to Christ? Is your teaching, teaching such the scripture, connecting them to Christ? Is your work? in the church, connecting them to Christ, is your service in the church, connecting them to Christ, is your singing, connecting them to Christ, is your smile, connecting them to Christ. You see, the reason why we come is so that we ourselves will be connected to Christ. And then any worshiper there, any sinner there, any inquirer there, any seeker there will want to connect them to Christ. Are you connecting strangers to Christ? They've never been in a place like this before. And they have never seen Jesus Christ. They don't know what salvation is. They don't know what a life in Christ is. They're strangers. Strangers to God. Strangers to Christ. Christ and strangers to the gospel, and they need somebody who is familiar with Christ the Lord so that they can connect them with the Lord Jesus Christ. Come back here to verse 21. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of the seed of Galilee, and they desired him, saying, Tell me, everybody. Sir, we would see Jesus. What did they mean by that? They wanted to see Jesus the Messiah. They, they have heard at the kind of at the feast they attended that there's a Passover lamb. And then somebody said, Do you know he has come? Because we remember that John said, Behold the Lamb of God. Do you know he has come? Somebody said, We've seen the Messiah of whom Moses wrote in the law, Jesus of Nazareth. They said, Okay. If he has come, 
the Messiah. How can we live without seeing him? They said, we must see the Savior. Somebody said, ah, even in Samaria, already Samaritans know, and they said, we know and believe that this is the Savior of the world. They said, if the Samaritans have seen him, why shouldn't we see him? They wanted to see Jesus, the Messiah. They wanted to see Jesus, the Savior. They wanted to see Jesus, the teacher. Here comes Nicodemus saying that we know that that was the teacher come from heaven. Because no man can do these miracles that you are doing except God be with him. And somebody told them that teacher, the teacher of all teachers, the teacher above all teachers, and the teacher come from heaven the exalted teacher. He has come. They said, we cannot go back home then. Why did we come to Jerusalem? We have not, not seen him. We must see him. Why did you come? You must see him today. I said, you must see him today. They wanted to see Jesus, the teacher. They said, you know, the, the Pharisees were talking. You know what he said the other time? He said, this is the cheap cornerstone which the builders have neglected and rejected. Oh, they said, how can a building stand without the cornerstone? If Jesus, the cornerstone, has come, we we'll want to see that cornerstone, the cornerstone of the spiritual temple, and the cornerstone that will make our life stand so lead and serve us in the things of the Lord. That's why they came and they said, want to see that cornerstone. He said, did you hear the other time actually he was preaching and he said the good shepherd gave his life for the sheep. You mean the shepherd has come? We must see him, the shepherd of my soul. You'll see him tonight. I said, you'll see him tonight. And then you'll be able to say now, I've seen him, the Lord is, tell me, my shepherd. And I shall not want salvation will be yours. Healing will be yours. Deliverance will be yours. And strength will be yours in Jesus' name. Here is Nathaniel saying, we know thou art the king of Israel. You mean the king has come? Somebody higher than Caesar? Higher than Herod? You mean he has come? Somebody higher than the greatest person in our country? You, you mean he has come? I must see him then. You will see the king of kings. You will see the lord of laws. And he will be the lord of your life. And he will be the Pass over land that will take your sins away in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 12 of John. John chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 1. And then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, and whom he raised from the dead. Look at verse 12 there. In verse 12, it tells us that um, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast, that is, come to the Passover, they said, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, and then uh, the things that followed, and here is Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb, that is going to be sacrificed for the sins of the world, First Corinthians chapter 5. In First Corinthians chapter 5, uh, reading from verse 7. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lamb, as ye are leaven, for even Christ our, tell me, Passover is sacrifice for us. They said, all that Passover feast without Christ, without Jesus, without the final Passover lamb, is useless and vain, is empty and unworthy, and it is unworthy even of our attention. And we have done all this worship in Jerusalem, and we have not seen him. I must see him today. I said, I must see him today. You'll see him in Jesus' name. Tonight, our study is on salvation for many through the uplifted Christ. Salvation for many through the uplifted Christ. And the three points we're looking at, number one, the full result of his vicarious death. The full result of his vicarious death. Because, you know, he said, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And this is saying, signifying the death by which he will glorify the Lord. The uplifted Christ, the one who was lifted up on the cross of Calvary to take our sins away to take a curse away, to take our sicknesses away, to take all the evil consequences.
consists of a first Adam to take everything away from us, the full result of his vicarious death. Point number two, the father's reassurance of his victorious dominion. That Jesus Christ is glorified and he has dominion and the father gave assurance from heaven. The father's reassurance of his victorious dominion. Point number three, a faithful response and valiant dedication. You see, after hearing about Jesus, after seeing Jesus, after seeing him lifted up, crucified for you, crucified for me, and is born, all our suffering, all our sorrow, all our shame, all our sin, and all our sicknesses, there must be a response coming from you. That's why we have that point number three, a faithful response and valiant dedication. Point number one, what's number one there? I said what's number one, let the preachers hear the preacher's voice. The full result of his vicarious death. I'm reading here from verse 23 now. Because now they are they come to Jesus and they brought these uh, Greeks to Jesus because they wanted to see Jesus. Jesus the Passover Lamb. Jesus the Savior. Jesus the Redeemer. Jesus the King of Kings. Jesus the Lord of Lords. Now they came to him because they were brought to him. What did he tell them? Look at verse 23. And Jesus answered them saying, the hour is come that the Son of Man shall be glorified. He'll be glorified in your life. And this is the hour. I said this is the hour. He'll be glorified in your life in Jesus' name. And then look at verse 24. It says, Very late, very late, I say unto you, except a kind of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. You see something the disciples did not understand is that Christ will die. That Jesus will die. You see something that the Pharisees don't understand is that the Messiah will die. You see something all the Jewish people do not understand is that he will die. That if he is the Son of God, if he is the Christ, how can he talk about his death? Because they said, we have learned and we have heard that the Christ, the Messiah, he abided forever. How say you then that this Son of God will die? Who is this Son of Man? By the way, he was telling them now that don't you have something practical about the Savior's death that very late, very late, surely I say unto you, except a kind of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. If I just remain like this, if I don't go to Calvary, if I don't give my life blood, if I don't give the sacrifice, everything will remain as it is. You remain in your sin and abide in my righteousness, but I'll be alone. But if the corn of wheat will fall, into the ground and die, then it will bring forth fruit. That means if Christ will die, and thank God, Christ has died for you. I say, Christ has died for you, and that is the Christ that died, that is risen again. That's what he's bringing for fruit. And many people are coming unto him because he died for our sins so that he can bear our sins. Actually, they should have understood that because the Old Testament predicted and prophesied the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the death of the Lamb that will come and die for our sins and then it will bring many, many unto him. Isaiah chapter 53. In Isaiah chapter 53, here I'm reading from verse 3. Isaiah chapter 53, and we're reading from verse 3. It says, it's despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Look at verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs. I said, Surely he has borne your grief and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgression. You see, he had to die. The corn of wheat had to fall into the ground and die, so that he will not abide alone, so that he will bring many sons unto glory. He was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, everybody tell me, 
You are healed in Jesus' name. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see that? That's the purpose of his death. That's why he went to the cross of Calvary, and that's why he died. Look at verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall cease the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, save many, forgive many, redeem many. And then he says, For he shall bear their iniquity. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto Tell me. He has poured out his soul unto everybody. Tell me out and out unto death. That's what he meant when he said, except the corn of which shall fall into the ground and die. It will abide alone. But if it die, then it will produce many fruits. And then he says, was numbered with the transgressors, and he bear the sin of many, and made intercession for transgressors. And that's what he meant when he said concerning himself, but he lay very I say unto you, except a kind of weight fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth, tell me, it bringeth forth, tell me out aloud, much fruit. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 and see what, uh, you know, what he's saying. We've read the Old Testament Isaiah and we've seen that he was talking about his predicted death. Now he's going to uh, tell us again Hebrews chapter 2 and I'm reading from verse 9. So you will see what his death has now done. It says, but we'll see Jesus. Somebody there is going to see Jesus. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for who? For every man, for he became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. That's the result of that sacrifice. That's the result of that death. That result of giving himself. That's why he said, except this corn of which shall fall into the ground and die. Except he'll die. That means except Christ will go to Calvary and then die and be buried and then rise again. Except that happens. Well, not be able, he'll not be able to bring many sons unto glory, but not because of his death, he has not brought many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. And I pray that you realize and you partake of this benefit of the cross, benefit of Calvary in Jesus' name. That that salvation that Christ produced and provided at Calvary, it will come to you. That redemption will come to you. That breaking of the yoke that you did on the cross of Calvary, it will be yours in Jesus' name. And all the result of the redemption, all the result of uh, the provision of Calvary will come to your life as you believe and understand he died for me. As you believe and understand, he died so that I can take all my sins away. As you believe and understand, I'm going to turn away from sin. I'm going to hold on to Christ and trust Christ and believe in Christ. I'm going to give my life wholeheartedly, unreservedly unto him, so that that benefit of Calvary, that benefit of the cross will be mine. It will be yours today in Jesus' name. That, that's uh, the Savior's death. Let me show you another thing. Our own self-denial. If he had his own death and died on the cross of Calvary, now he comes to us and is telling us in chapter 12 of John, John chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 25. He says, He that loveth his life shall lose it. 
And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. What does that mean? Look up here. He's saying the same thing about you, about the believer, about me, about us together, that he said about himself. He who protects his life to preserve his life, the life is so delicate and it cannot come to Christ and have that kind of wheat fall into the ground and die, he will abide alone. As you look at your life and you protect that life to preserve that life, my life is mine, my time is mine, my gifts are mine, my ability is mine, everything I possess is mine, I'm guarding it, I'm protecting it, it will not fall into the ground and die, you'll abide alone. You'll be poor spiritually, you'll be poor eternally, but when that kind of wheat will fall into the ground, and die and say, here is my life. I give it to, to Christ. I identify with Christ who died on the cross of Calvary. He says, he that loveth his life shall lose it. He who protects his life shall lose it. Who does not have self-denial shall lose that life. But he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life everlasting. If any man serve me, let him follow me. If any man serve me, let him do what I've done. I denied myself. I accepted the suffering. I accepted the crucifixion. I accepted the death. I accepted the burial. And now resurrection has come. If you are following me, if you are going to do what I'm doing, there must be self-denial to you. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant also be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Look at what he's saying in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 37. Matthew chapter 10, he spoke about himself, now he's speaking about the believer. He denied himself. He died the death at Calvary on the cross for you and for me. And he says, you too, you have to do the same. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me of me, that is, uh, the people who say, my dad will not allow me to repent, my mom will not allow me to repent, and I don't want to lose the favor of dad or mom, you'll be alone, you'll be alone by yourself, the salvation of Christ will not come to you, and the joy of heaven will not come to you, he who fears or who loves the son or daughter more than me, my son does not like, uh, you know, that you go deep in the Lord, he doesn't even like uh, going to ordinary church, not to talk about are going to a deeper church, not to talk about holiness church, and not to talk about, you know, a church that is going to stand on the totality of the word of God. My daughter does not like this. My daughter says, Daddy, Mommy, we can go to any other place, but not deeper. We can go to any other place, but not holy. We can go to any other place, but not a place where they say there's no sin at all. Everybody must do the will of God. And the fellow who says, I would have believed but my, for my daughter, I would I've been given my life, but for my son, he says, Who, whosoever loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Verse 39, he that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Is calling unto self-denial. It says that if you're going to belong to the Lord, you'll deny your yourself of the works of the flesh. You'll deny yourself of the indulgence of the flesh. You'll deny yourself of that relationship with the same partner. You'll deny yourself of the joy from that alcohol or whatever it is or pan wine. You'll deny yourself of all the other things you surround yourself with. It says without that, except you kind of wheat fall into the ground and die. It's going to abide alone. But if it die, then it'll bring forth much fruit. We're looking at Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. Luke chapter 9 verse 23. And he said unto them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You see, there are people, uh, they, they pamper themselves, they indulge themselves, and they're so very careful. I cannot repent. I cannot give up that. I cannot give up this. You know, I belong to high society. 
that high society will take you to the other side. You cannot deny yourself of sin. You cannot deny yourself of evil. You cannot deny yourself of occultism. You cannot deny yourself of idolatry because I belong to, because I belong to that kind of a membership will take you to hell. But when you understand that you have to take up your cross and you have to deny yourself and you follow Christ and you follow Christ wholeheartedly with all your heart, with all your soul, with with all your mind, not minding whatever, you have to forgo, you have to forsake, because that is the principle, except this kind of wheat will fall into the ground and die, it will abide alone, but if this kind of wheat shall fall into the ground and die, then it will bring forth fruit, I pray that it will bring forth fruit. I said you'll be for fruit, but it'll be the self-denial. It's on our Savior's death, and now our owner, the self-denial. And it says in verse 24, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. I, I'm coming back to John. In John chapter 12, I'm reading here from verse 26. John chapter 12 verse 26 if any man serve me let him follow me and where I am there shall also my servant be where I am somebody there tell me where I am there shall also my servant be let me hear church there also shall my servant be you know what he's talking about? He's speaking to us about, number one, the Savior's death. He's speaking to us, number two, about our self-denial. And now he's telling us the saint's destiny. The saint's destiny. That is, those who come to Christ, those who are born again through Christ, and those who have given up their sins, and now they belong to Christ, and they keep following Christ, following Christ, following Christ, until the very end, this is the saint's destiny. Whosoever he he says, he's serving me, he will be my servant, and where I am, there shall my servant be. Where Jesus is right now, where is Jesus now? I say, where is Jesus now? He's in Jerusalem. Okay, he's uh, at the River Jordan. Capernaum. Where is our Jesus? Where is our Lord? Our King of Kings, where is he? He is in heaven, and he says, if you serve me, there shall my servant be. You will be there. I said you will be there. Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above. Set your affections on things above. Let your life be heavenly. Let your thoughts be heavenly. Let your desires be heavenly. Let your aspirations be heavenly. And it says over here, you set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ so is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I'll be there. I said I will be there. You'll be there in Jesus' name. We're looking at John chapter 14, verse 3. John chapter 14, and we're looking at verse 3. It tells us in verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, where I am, there ye may be also. There are some people that may come to you and they are selling some uh, magazine and they are saying, you know, they are going to live on earth here forever. They are going to be in the dusty place, in the place of uh, mosquitoes all forever. I'm not going to be in this place forever. The, where he is, there I will be. I said where he is, there I will be. Where is he? I said where is he? Anybody going to heaven? 
you'll be there in Jesus' name. We're looking at John, we're looking at John chapter 17, John chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world, and for their sakes I sanctified myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. Are we one? That they all may be one. I said, that we one accord? As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them. And thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Look at verse 24, Father, 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 I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Be with me where I am. What is that? I'm going there. I said you are going there. Nothing will stop you. You'll not stop your journey halfway. So that where I am, there they will be. That they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lost me before the foundation of the world will be there. You will be there. What does it take? Look at First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. He says, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when it shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. We're coming to point number two now. We're looking at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And I'm reading from verse 27. John chapter 12. And we're reading from verse 27. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Here we're looking at Jesus Christ. He's thinking of Calvary now. He's thinking of the cross. Is thinking of the sacrifice, is thinking of that suffering, is going to be our sin bearer, is going to be the sacrificial lamb, is going to be our substitute. He was committed to God's glory. And that's why he prayed, he said, as I look forward, bearing the Lord, bearing the weight, bearing the suffering, bearing the shame, bearing the eternal agony, and bearing all the eternal punishment of the sins of the whole world, of the, of the descendants of Adam, of your sin, of my sin, of everybody's sin, and bearing the eternal punishment of all the people on earth, it was going to be a heavy load. It was going to be a time of agony. It was going to be a time of suffering. That's why I said, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. No, I cannot say that. Save me from this hour. How will the world be saved? Redeem me, take me away, rescue me from this cross. No, he could not say that. And then he says, 
But for this cause, for this purpose, for this reason, came I to this hour. And then he said, Father, Father, glorify thy name. You see, he was committed to the glory of God. He was committed to the glory of the Father. That's why he prayed, the Father should glorify his name. Father, verse 28, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I above glorified it and will glorify it again. The Father responded immediately. The Father answered immediately. The Father gave him assurance. And then he says, And the people therefore that stood by had it and said that it thundered. All the said, An angel spoke to him. It, it was like thunder in the ears of the people that heard. And Jesus said in verse 30, I answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. It gave me assurance that I'm going to have this victorious dominion. He gave me this assurance. You could have recognized the voice of the Father. Even if the Father spoke to him silently, quietly, but because of those people that were there, the voice of the Father came out like a thunder, so that they will know this is he, the Son of God, so that they will know this is he, the one that will bear all our sins away. And Jesus said, that voice came out aloud, not because of me, I could have heard it quietly, but it came out like a thunder because of you, so that you will know I am He. And now, in verse 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Cast out. Cast out. Somebody shout, cast out. The prince of this world, cast out from your heart. Cast out from your family. Cast out from your surrounding. Cast out from your wife, your husband. Cast out from everything around you in Jesus' name. And when the prince of this world is cast out, victory has come to you. Strength has come to you. And power has come to you in Jesus' name. Christ went to the cross of Calvary so that that enemy of your soul and that enemy of your future and that enemy of your destiny will be cast out and today it has happened in Jesus name. And look at this number one, the purpose of his coming. The purpose of his coming. Look at verse 27, verse 28 now is my soul troubled and what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause came I into this world, for this cause, for this purpose came I into this world. Father, glorify thy name. And there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The purpose of his coming. What's the purpose of his coming? The disciples needed to hear this and Jesus said, look at chapter chapter 9 of Luke. Luke chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 44. Luke chapter 9 verse 44. In Luke chapter 9 verse 44, here it tells us that, um, and let these saints sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. Let this all sink into your ear. Don't play with this one. Don't leave it superficial, floating in your mind or floating in your heart. Let this saying sink into your ear that Jesus Christ is going to die. Jesus Christ is going to give his life. And Jesus Christ is going to be sacrificed. The sacrifice for the sin of every one, for the sin of the man, the sin of the woman, the sin of the youth, the sin of the boy there, and the sin, sin of uh, the young girl there, so that everyone, you know how to repent, and you know how to turn away from sin, and come to this Savior who died for you, because without seeing him, without knowing him, without coming to him, you will perish in your sin, but he says, let this one sink in your ear, that Jesus Christ, for the purpose that you may be saved. 
saved for the purpose that your sins might be forgiven. He died upon the cross of Calvary. Luke chapter 24. I'm reading here from verse 26. Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 26. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? That's the purpose. He suffered. He sacrificed. The pain was there. The punishment of the sin of the whole world came upon him. That's the purpose why he came and began at Moses. And all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Look at this 44. In verse 44, he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and he said unto them thus it is written and thus he behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and at repentance and remission of sin shall be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem so you understand the purpose of his coming but then we look at John chapter 12 the prayer of Christ the prayer of Christ. We're looking at John chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 28. Father, glorify thy name. That's the prayer that he prayed. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it, and will glorify it again. And the people therefore that stood by heard it and said uh, that it thundered. Others said, an angel speak unto him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. He prayed, and the Father answered. He's praying for you right now, and the Father will answer. We're looking at chapter 13, chapter 13, verses start to 1 and 32. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. And if God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. And so we see that he offered a prayer to the Lord, Father, glorify thyself. And the answer came, I've glorified it, I'm going to glorify it again. And now we come to the Prince who is Conquered. The prince is conquered. We're looking at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And I'm reading from the start to one. John chapter 12. The start to one. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Now, somebody shout now. Shall the prince of this world the cast out. The cast out. Who is the prince of this world? Satan. He will not have authority in your life. He will not have the final say in your life. He will not have power to oppress in your life again in Jesus' name. Now. I said now. Today. The prince of this world will be cast out. Thank God it has happened. Tonight you are free. I said tonight you are free. You'll be totally free in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 10. I'm looking at Luke chapter 10. And I'm looking at verse 17. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. It says, and the 70 returned again with joy. Somebody is going back home with joy tonight. I said, somebody, their newcomer, you are going back home tonight with joy in Jesus' name. Daddy, mommy, old timer, old member, worker, preacher, and members, you are going back home with joy tonight. That thing will be under your feet. That problem will be under your feet. That priest will be under your feet. I see victory on your face. I see dominion on your face. I see the joy on your face. 
the joy of an overcomer. Thank God I see the overcomer there and you will overcome in Jesus' name. It says the 70 came back with joy. Not an exception. All the 70. That means all the people that hear the word of God, all the people that go forth believing the word of God, all the people that stand firm on the authority of the word of God, knowing that this word of God cannot fail. I said this word I'm preaching to you cannot fail. And then you'll go back home with joy tonight in Jesus' name. Hey, look at look at verse 18. And he said unto them, he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He has fallen. He will not try so big in your life. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and 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 you must believe that every time, every time, every time when you get back home, think on that word, nothing shall by any means hurt you. In the village, nothing shall by any means hurt you. In the local church, nothing shall by any means hurt you. When you are alone, nothing shall by any means hurt you. When you are in the midst of people, nothing shall by any means hurt you. When the enemies are there, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this Rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Thank God my name is there. I said, thank God my name is there. Your name is there if you have repented, if you have called upon the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have abandoned your sins, and you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, your name is there. I pray your name will remain there. In Colossians, Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 15. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it triumphing over them in it somebody there has the victory already Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14, Hebrews chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 14. Here it says in verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that he through death might destroy him that has the power of death, that is the devil is destroyed. His power is destroyed. His programs are scattered. His conspiracy is crushed. It says he has power to destroy him that has the power of death, that he is the devil. Thank God tonight I am free. I say thank God tonight I am free. First John chapter 3, First John chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 8. First John chapter 3, verse 8, He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, somebody help me, for this purpose, somebody shout it up, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Tell me out aloud, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. When will he destroy the works of the devil in your life? Sickness is work of the devil. Oppression work of the devil. Attack work of the devil. Affliction work of the devil. Temptation work of the devil. Occultic power work of the devil. Tonight, tonight. Somebody shout tonight. The works of the devil, they are destroyed in Jesus' name. Barrenness there is destroyed. Terminal disease there is destroyed. Cancer there is destroyed. And all the yoke, everything is broken in Jesus' name. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Give me a good, good church. Amen. Romans, Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 20. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. And the God of priests shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. 
the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Satan has been utterly defeated at Calvary. And today, you will experience that victory. Enjoy that victory. You will identify with the Lord and you come into the victory in Jesus' name. Now, after we've heard the word of God about his vicarious death, about his victorious dominion, after we've heard the word of God about the Savior's death, about our self-denial, about the saint's destiny, and about the purpose of his coming, and about the prayer of Christ, and about the praise being conquered and destroyed and defeated, who's to be your response? That brings us to point number three, our faithful response and valiant dedication. Our faithful response and valiant dedication. We're coming to chapter 12 of John. John chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 32. John chapter 12. Reading from verse 32, it says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. He's talking about his crucifixion. He's talking about his being lifted up on the cross. He's talking about his dying on that accursed tree when it said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, you see that is the meaning now, this he said, signifying what death he should die. Then the people answered him, we have heard out of the law that Christ abided forever, and how seest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, yet a little while is the light with you, walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you, for he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. He says, while ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. The saying speak Jesus, and departed, and did hide himself from them. As we look at this response, number one, we're looking at this uplifted Christ, discerning the meaning of the uplifted Christ. Discerning. We need to discern. We need to understand. We need to recognize what he's saying about him being lifted up, discerning the meaning of the uplifted Christ. Sure. We also want to draw men to the uplifted Christ. Drawing men to the uplifted Christ. Because he said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto myself. And then the direct message of the uplifted Christ. What message is he giving us? As he says, Here is the light, and you walk in the light. Here is the light, and you abide in the light. Here is the light, and then you lead other people in the way of the light that the direct message of the uplifted Christ. Number one, discerning the meaning of the uplifted Christ. We're coming back to that John chapter 12. John chapter 12 verse 32 and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. What's the meaning of that? Look at verse 33. They said he, signifying what death he should die. He's talking about his death. He's spoken about that before John chapter 3. John chapter 3, we're reading it from verse 14. In verse 14 it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's the uplifted Christ. And this is the meaning. Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so that everyone that beheld, everyone that looked, actually got healed from all the infirmities and all their sicknesses. And the Lord is saying, as Moses has lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man, even so the Lamb of God, even so this Jesus Christ will be lifted up on the cross of Calvary. Then it says in verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus has been lifted up. He has died on the cross of Calvary. And as you believe tonight, you will not perish. 
as you turn away from sin and turn to the Savior tonight, you will not perish. As you abandon darkness and come to the fullness of light, Jesus, the light of the world, you will not perish in Jesus' name. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, whosoever, you see there tonight, whosoever, I said the sheep there tonight, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Look at John chapter 8, verse 28. John chapter 8, verse 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man. You see, he was talking about that all the time. They are going to lift him up on the cross of Calvary and on the tree. It says, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as the Father has taught me, I speak these things. He has been lifted up, and now, because he's lifted up, he's able to take all our sins away. But you see the result of his being lifted up, drawing men to the uplifted Christ. Drawing men to the uplifted Christ. We're looking at John chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 32. John chapter 12. 12, verse 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Will draw all men unto me, drawing men to the uplifted Christ. And that's what we need to do, helping people to see Christ and to repent, turning away from their sins, so that they can come to be with Christ their Savior. Acts of the Apostles chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 30. Acts chapter 17, and we're looking at verse 30. It says the times of this ignorance God went at, but now, 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 commandeth all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere to repent. That's how they are drawn to Christ all men, all men to repent in Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22, reading from verse 14. Acts chapter 22, reading from verse 14. And he said, the God of our fathers has chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and should hear the voice of his mouth, for thou shalt be his witness unto how many people? All men of what thou hast seen and heard. And he wants us to tell people that they have the chance of repenting. They have the chance of coming to the Lord. And that salvation is available. Available to the man. Available to the woman. Available to the boy. Available to the girl. Available to every sinner. Available to those who are guilty. Because all the world is guilty. All are seen and come short of the glory of God. And that salvation is available today. It is available for all men. Those people outside this problem inside and anywhere you are hearing the sound of my voice, salvation, forgiveness, and freedom, regeneration, and redemption is now available for all men. Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 18. Romans chapter 5, verse 18. Remember, this is yours because available for all men. It says, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even and so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men, all men, all men, unto justification of life. This redemption now is for all men. And you are there tonight, there should be no doubt in your heart, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Tell the people around you, tell the, the people in your neighborhood, salvation has now come, and it is for all men, because Jesus Jesus died for everyone. Titus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. 
great sinners, little sinners, young sinners, uh, perpetual sinners, habitual sinners, but cleaning sinners, everyone. Grace of God is available. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us the dinner and ungodliness and worldly laws. You should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. That salvation will be yours. I said that salvation will be yours. First Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. First Timothy chapter 2. And we're reading from verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants all men to be saved. You're included. You're included. As you call on the name of the Lord, as you turn away from your sin, as you embrace Him, as you trust Him, as you believe Him, as you accept Him, as you hand over yourself, your life totally unto Him, He'll draw you unto Himself. Number three of this session, the direct message of the uplifting Christ, the direct message of the uplifted Christ. Look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 35. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while ye have light, is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. It says, For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have the light, believe in the light. The light is here tonight. Christ is here tonight. The light of the world is here tonight. And as you believe in him, he'll give you eternal life. He'll give you salvation. He'll give you freedom. He'll give you forgiveness of sin. He'll give you redemption in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 12 of John, verse 46. In verse 46, I am come in light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. You will not abide in darkness. Look at John chapter 8 and in verse 11. John chapter 8 verses 11 and 12. It says in John chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, she said, No man, Lord, and Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You are going in the strength of the Lord. You are going with the salvation of the Lord. You are going with the knowledge of the fact that the light of the world will drive away every darkness out of your life in Jesus' name. But you must make up your mind and turn away from that darkness and turn away from that sin and turn away from that evil. He says, neither do I condemn you. Whatever you have done in the past, he says, he has the right to forgive and he has the joy of forgiving you and he has the privilege of forgiving you. But now he says, he gives you salvation. He gives you freedom. He gives you the power to go and sin no more and he commands you, go and sin no more. Then speak Jesus. Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. Not I was, not I will be. Even today is the light of the world. Is the light in your life. Is the light in your family. Is the light in every darkness of every sinner in Jesus' name. The backslider is in darkness too, in the darkness of backsliding, in the darkness of sin. But now, as you look at Jesus Christ tonight, the light of the world, he'll take all the backsliding away in Jesus' name. And whatever bound you, and whatever is binding you inside that dungeon of darkness, the Lord will dispel all the darkness tonight, and light will come in your soul, will come in your heart, and will come in your spiritual experience. In Jesus' name. Verse 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You'll have the light of life. I will have the light of life. And darkness will not remain in your life in Jesus' name. First John chapter 1, First John chapter 1, we're reading from verse 5. First John chapter 1, we're looking at verse 5. It says, This then is the message which ye have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light. Somebody there say, God is light. Let me hear your voice. 
Let heaven hear your voice. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Look at verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light, I'll walk in the light. If we walk in the light, I'll walk in the light. You know, he has enough grace, abundant grace, sufficient grace to make you walk in the light. And whatever the power of darkness, holding you down to darkness, it will set you free tonight in Jesus' name. And everything of righteousness, everything of grace, everything of light will come to your life. And all those things that are hiding inside darkness, and they're hiding the darkness of your life, the light of Christ will wash everything away in Jesus' name. Have you noticed, have you noticed any time there's darkness, all those reptiles and cockroaches and whatever, they're hiding. But once we switch on the light, then they begin to find their way. And tonight we're going to switch on the light. The light of heaven is going to come in your soul. The light of Christ is going to come in your life. And as we switch on the light, and you enter into the light, all the things that have been hiding there, troubling your life, everything will find their way out in Jesus' name. It says in verse 7, and if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, tell me out aloud, Tell me over there, cleanses us from all sin, all sin. Everything is vanishing tonight. Everything is going away tonight. But look at chapter 2 here. Chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 8. It tells us in verse 8 again, a new commandment I write unto you, in which sin is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. Darkness passes in your life. Darkness of sin passes in your life. And the darkness of occultism is gone away from your life. The darkness of idolatry is gone away from your life in Jesus' name. And all the darkness of secret sinning, secret sinning, don't let them hear this, don't let them hear this. Tonight, the Lord will forgive you. The Lord will cleanse you. And all that secrecy and hypocrisy, everything will vanish away in Jesus' name. He says, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Look at verse 9. He that says he, he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. If there's hatred in your heart, Put it out tonight because hatred is of darkness and hatred makes Satan to have power and authority over you. You'll be free tonight. I said you'll be free tonight. You are to hate sin. You are not to hate people. And he says in verse 10, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. I will abide in the light. I said, I'll abide in the light, and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness has blinded his eyes. But you are coming into the light. And when you are the light and you abide in the light, and then you finish your Christian race in that light, from this light over here, then you go to the light in eternity in Jesus' name. But you know, if you remain in darkness here and you die in darkness, in the darkness of sin, secret sin, darkness of idolatry, darkness of occultism, darkness of worshiping Satan, if you die in that darkness, you will go to eternal darkness. And there, there's no light, there's no water, there's no ease, there's no peace, and then you suffer forever and ever, for God forbid, that will not happen to you. I said it will not happen to you, but you come out of darkness and you come into the light and you're not staying behind closed doors to do any evil anymore. Your life is plain. Your life is transparent and your life is according to the will, according to the word of God. Whatever you say inside, you're willing to say outside. Whatever you do inside, you're willing to do outside because now your life is in the light and you are transparent. And when the trumpet shall sound and the people of God shall rise up and then go to heaven. Thank God you'll be there. When the saints go marching in, I'll be there. I said I will be there. 
and I will be there, you'll be there in Jesus' name. First John chapter 3, First John chapter 3, we're looking at verse 3. It says, and every man, every man, every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. The blood of Jesus available tonight, he'll wash you clean. He'll wash your water than snow. And all the works of the devil tonight, when are they going to be destroyed? Sickness, when is it going? Evil spirit, when is it going? All the weakness in your life, when is it going? And darkness, when is it going? Light, when is it coming in? Grace, when is it coming in? Salvation, when is it coming in? Victory, when is it coming in? And the light of heaven shining across your pathway to drive all the works of the devil away. When will it happen in your life? Today, today, now, it is coming. I said, today it is coming. What is he coming there? I said, what is he coming there? Congratulations, you have the victory tonight. Rise up and say, Lord, here am I. I have the victory. Lord, here am I. I have the victory. Christ has done everything for us. Christ has died on the cross of Calvary. And now he's calling you. Come, come. And the victory will be yours. Come, and the victory will be yours. Remember, don't just stay there because this kind of wheat, except he falls to the ground and die. It abideth alone. But if he die, then it will bring forth much fruit. And the Lord is calling you that that will be fulfilled in your life tonight. And then every walk of Satan, every walk of the devil, sin and evil, everything is going tonight. And it will live your life tonight. In Jesus' name, open your mouth and talk to the Lord today. And you tell the Lord, I want to have the benefit of the Savior's death. I want to have the benefit of Calvary. I want to have the benefit of the sacrifice of Christ. I want to have the benefit of what Christ has done for me and you're willing to deny yourself and you're willing to bury all those things that are not of God in your life and he says now is the prince of this world cast out let him be defeated in your life and you tell the Lord, Lord tonight I want that victory from Calvary, I want it in my life tonight and it will happen, it will happen, it will happen, all your sins will be taken away and everything he will forgive and it will set you free, it will make you spirit. It will make you have a life, a new life in Christ, a new power in Christ. It will help you. It will help you. Call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord. Don't let your nice Bible study be in vain in your life. You have come to study so that the benefit of the study and the benefit of the revelation will come to you tonight. And Christ has been lifted up Christ has been lifted up. Why don't you come to him? Why don't you come to him? And why don't you say, Lord, here am I, and he'll give you the victory. Here am I, and he'll give you, he'll give you that righteousness flowing from Calvary. He'll do it tonight. He'll do it tonight. He'll do it tonight. It's your lifted Christ. He's drawing you unto himself, and come unto the Lord, and abide with the Lord.